Since we are uh, talking about a subject that is international, I wanted to begin by saying that nous sommes ici avec mon ami Nicolas Hazard, <laughs> de Group SOS, and also with my, my mate <laughs> from North London, correct? <laughs> Dan Varelowitz. And we're going to be actually having a, a pretty important conversation about the question of replication. Uh, each of these gentlemen represents a tremendous amount of um, passion and interest and also experience in thinking about a lot of the questions that uh, some of our earlier speakers were talking about. And I'm not going to sort of dive into what I think some of those questions are right yet, but after each of them gives you a little bit of an introduction, um, I think we will probe them rather deeply. And for me, it's actually sort of a pleasure to be with a small group for an hour. Um, so selfishly, this is a s total treat for me. For our gentlemen here who've come a long ways to be with us, um, if you can act really big and you know, ask lots of questions and keep them really energized, um, that would be uh, super, because I know it's kind of getting towards lunchtime. So I'm going to start with Dan. I know you've got a brief introduction, and we'll roll that. And then uh, you, can, you can kind of finish your introduction, and then we'll turn it over to Nicolas, OK? Great. Whichever you wish. Your mic will go on if you. OK. Um... Do you want to roll the slides? OK, so I've uh, decided to make my life slightly difficult, uh, and hopefully this presentation is slightly more interesting, by presenting in the style of Peta Kucha, um, Japanese presentation technique. 20 slides. Each slide lasts for just 20 seconds, and they auto advance. So if you see me running out of breath or panicking, that'll be why. So uh, I've worked for an NGO called SEDEC uh, for the last four or five years. Uh, it's a Jewish organization, but working regardless of race or religion in Ghana and India. This is a picture of me on my last day with my little boy, Sonny, wearing an I Love Tzedek t-shirt, just to prove that I did have a lot of commitment. Now, working for an NGO, I got quite frustrated, actually. I got frustrated because we were a grant-giving organization, giving to organizations like these. Um, these are three different uh, organizations making baskets in India. Uh, each NGO was different, each doing their own thing, enormous reinvention of the wheel and waste of resources. And actually what I started to realize is that it's sometimes the old ideas, the ones that are tried and tested, like the wheel and fire, for example, that work. Um, and actually maybe we should be doing a bit more of that. But beyond that, something else really frustrated me, which was that actually these projects tended to be able to uh, help sort of 50, maybe 100 people really successfully, but the problems were huge and growing. And actually, there's a real issue matching up solutions that work to growing, growing social problems out there. So I um, started doing a bit of thinking about this and got onto a program called the Claw Social Leadership Program. This is Dame Mary Marsh, who runs the program. Uh, she's on the board of HSBC and runs a national children's charity. And um, it was just a great opportunity for me to think about this issue of scale. How do you match the scale of solution to the scale of problem? And pretty early on, I came across a brilliant organization called the Trussell Trust, who are a food bank uh, based in the UK. Very simple model. They help people in emergency food situations. Uh, so um, people donate food, they hand them out. So 2004, they had a brilliant, brilliant model that was really working, helping a lot of people in their local community. And they decided they want to get this over the whole country. So what did they do? They boxed it up. They created a charity in a box, business in a box. In there went the brands, the systems, the processes, the monitoring and evaluation tools, everything you need to replicate. That was 2004. So a few years later now, they've uh, spread this across the whole UK. There are 250 replications of food, food bank across the UK, uh, helping over 200,000 people out of food poverty. They've really managed to very rapidly reach scale. And uh, you know they started small, but now they're opening about two a week at the moment. So really, really impressive. So I got excited, started to think about where else I could find models like this. And uh, you'll be pleased to hear I hung out in uh, the McDonald's head office in the UK for quite a bit. Uh, finding out about how their systems work, the body shop too. And I've actually just written a piece of research which will be published um, next month, uh, which McDonald's have green stamped, allowed me to use the golden arches. Started looking uh, in India, 
Childline India, it's a phone number that street kids can call up when they're in trouble, 1098, and they're connected to local charities and statutory organizations. Same thing as, the, as uh, Food Bank, they wanted to replicate over India, but they didn't want to grow big. They boxed it up, in the box went the technology, the brand, the guide for how you set up a child line. They are, year 2000 they did that, and now they're in uh, 215 cities across India with 450 partners. It's a really, really impressive scale by using this replication approach. I, as you can tell, got quite excited by all of this and met this, this guy, Michael Norton, uh, his uh, serial social entrepreneur. He's founded, I think, 40 organizations. And he, he said, uh, social franchising is it. Um, we should set up an international center for social franchising. So I, this is in October, I quit my job the next day and founded the International Center for Social Franchising. We're a not-for-profit. I wanted to do that because we're mission-focused. And our mission is to replicate 10 proven social projects in the next four years. So I'm here trying to find the best proven social projects to help replicate. Our business model is that we work with corporates. Um, you see GlaxoSmithKline, Experian there. Um, and we use the surplus, the money that we generate, to subsidize rates working with some great charities, NGOs, done some work with Oxfam, um, Street League in the UK, and a bit of work with Big Society Capital. So I want to just talk a little bit about the process that we go through um, when we're helping someone replicate. First thing is uh, it's about proof, proving the project uh, actually does, does what it says and is replicable. We do a feasibility study, which is a, a list of questions that we ask each organization. And you can find some of those questions on our website if you're interested for your own project. Once it's proved, it's about designing for scale. What is the best mechanism to use for scaling up? We don't go in saying we're going to franchise you. We go in saying what is the best route to scale? And very often, replication is it. We then uh, look at what we've got and say, right, uh, this is going to work, maybe it isn't. If it is going to work, we systematize. And that's about creating the box, what goes in that box. All the systems, the processes, everything you need to replicate your organization. And once you've done that, step four is repeating to scale. And that is around piloting. You'd normally do a pilot in maybe two or three different places, slightly different contexts to test it. And once it's tested, then you're ready for exponential growth, much like uh, those two case studies we saw, Childline and Food Bank. So that's, that's my 19 slides. This is my 20th slide coming up right now. Ah, close. <laughs> um, so I, I'm here really looking for proven ideas, um, ideas that could be scaled up. We partner with organizations. Uh, hopefully, some in the room are interested. I would love to hear if you've got any organizations. There's my phone number. Uh, who, phone number? There's my uh, email address. <laughs> uh, I'd love to hear if you've got uh, projects you think could be scaled up and, and have that conversation. So I'm looking forward to the conversation now. Thank you. Well done. <laughs> a quick uh, check of all of you. How many of you are social uh, entrepreneurs? How many of you have, have social enterprise ideas? Okay, so great. So we're in the right conversation. <laughs> um, Nicholas, how about an introduction from you? I think you have some slides or uh, video? Okay, one slide. I don't know if it works. Let's see what happens. Hello? I think it's coming. Yes, it's working. It's fine. We're, we're waiting for a slide, the slides. Sorry, everyone. A pregnant pause. A poignant pause. OK, great. There we go. Thank you. Um, I'm going to tell you a story about a French organization that is called Group SOS. Uh, Group SOS has been created 28 years ago. And uh, its founder, uh, there was a problem in France that was not solved, a social problem that, were, that was a problem with drug-addicted people. There were no structure in France in 1984 for drug-addicted people. So the founder of Group SOS decided to set up a social business oriented on drug-addicted people. 
after two years, um, he figured out that lots of the people that were in this structure, that were uh, the, the users of this uh, organization, uh, lots of them were HIV positive. So what we did, what he did actually, is to find and to organize and to set up an organization that could care about HIV positive people, and it was the first structure in France doing that before the public sector and all these kind of actors. But these drug addicted people, lots of them, uh, and people who were uh, HIV positive, they had no house. So he decided to set up a housing program. And the people they had who, have, uh, who had in houses uh, ha were totally unemployed. So he decided to develop other activities and so on. It's just to say that uh, the, the organization, how it ha has been structured, it's we, we on, on, we're focusing on the people more uh, rather than on the activity. We think that every single exclusion is a mix of several exclusion. So therefore, we have a wide range of activities trying to solve the big social issues that we're facing in, developing, in developed countries and not in, developed, in developing countries. So that means that our five big issues that we have uh, in France, but I think it's, uh, it's the same in the US and in Europe more globally. It's uh, health, so we have uh, structures uh, and entities that care about uh, um, health program for the people that are not able to have private insurance uh, system. Um, we do, uh, we have structure for elderly people because uh, people are getting older and older and lots of them are not able to have a uh, medicalized structure um, for caring for, yeah, for, for, for them. The, the third one is, um, is the housing. Obviously, housing is a big issue and especially for the poor people. Uh, the fourth issue is education because it starts there. Uh, finding, uh, giving the same chances to every uh, child uh, everywhere uh, in the world is absolutely fundamental. And the, five, the fifth problem is unemployment. So what we do is that we set up um, we programs and businesses that uh, hire only long-term excluded people from the labor market. So with all this structure, we globally 10,000 uh, employees, so 10,000 full-time jobs, mainly in France. Uh, we have an impact on over 1 million people in France. Uh, we, say, we usually say that we have 7 million people that are considered as poor in France, so it's quite a big part. And uh, we have 750 million uh, US dollar turnover every year. So we became slowly uh, the biggest social enterprise in France, uh, I think in Europe as well, and uh, one of the biggest in the world but focusing on the issues on, uh, of, um, of poor people, people that are facing exclusion in developed countries. Because the models are very different from developing countries and to developed countries, so we're really focusing on that, uh, finding the right solution for these poor, poor people. And what we figured out after 28 years, we set up an impact investing company because we thought that it was important as well to invest in other companies that find solutions. But mainly we try to replicate uh, what, uh, what we did in France. And I don't know lots of uh, English expression, but there is one that I know that is why reinvent the wheel. <laughs> I, I hear that all the time I come here. And so that's true. We developed uh, models that are that you can replicate, I think, in, uh, in the main, in lots of uh, developed countries. Obviously, you're not Coca-Cola. That means that you can't just take a model and say, I'm going to spread it to the world and do the same everywhere. You have always to adapt to the local context. So it's why we're working with partners in Japan, in uh, China, in um, South Korea, in Italy, in Spain, in the UK, and so on. And now. We're going to try to set up things also in the U.S. So I'm very happy to, to, to be here and to share our experience with you. Thank you. The, um, so um, how many of you were listening to the plenary speeches this morning? Um, how many were listening to the concepts? OK, so a lot of what people were talking about on the main stage here this morning was about scale. Um, and one of the things that I've observed over years of uh, practice and also 
thinking about some of these ideas that we're trying to use is that often social entrepreneurs and even social enterprise directors are confused about the difference between replicating and scale. So one of the things that I'm going to ask both of you to keep telling us about is how you think about replication and when you think it turns into scale. Okay, so we're going to try to focus on that and I'm going to get you all to help me by asking questions about that because you've got two really, really great models here um, that, that are ones that any of us can participate in. We can participate in Group SOS if we care to think about ourselves as a potential partner for expansion in the developed part of the world. Clearly, Dan is looking for uh, social entrepreneurs, social enterprises that could fit a franchising model because he's passionate about replication that turns into scale. So there's a lot of opportunity <laughs> sitting with me on this stage and uh, somehow in the next 45 minutes I want to make sure that we are together capitalizing on that opportunity. So I think where it starts is um, actually with the theme of this particular um, uh, uh, one hour, which is technically speaking the theme of public-private partnerships. Um, so before we get into sort of these questions of replication and scale, and Dan, I'll start with you. When you sort of decided to quit your job and start the center, how important was it to you to think about the, the relationship with the public sector in terms of being successful? Can you tell us a little bit about that in the UK and, and sort of as you think about your model? How important is the public sector? Um. So I don't know if this is going to be the answer you want, but uh, <laughs> I'm fairly agnostic to, to the sector, um, actually. I mean, I think in the UK particularly, there's some really sort of interesting potential with um, public-private partnerships. Um, but actually, <clears throat> you know, franchising, uh, social replication is a business model that applies to a whole host of different sectors. And um, we just did a bit of research for Big Society Capital uh, that a few people have probably heard of from a lot of Londoners around. It's a new billion dollar impact investment fund in the UK. And actually the research found um, that there's just no correlation between organizations that have successfully replicated and the structures. So there were a few charities, uh, there were a few um, sort of public-private partnerships there was everything. We have Kicks, which is sort of a sort of bit a hybrid model. Um, so I'm not, you know, when it comes to replication, I think the important thing is is not necessarily what the model is, but rather does the in it, does the thing that you're replicating is it worth replicating? Is it proven? So yeah. you're really much more interested in the business model yeah. and the question of whether the, the, the sort of public sector participates that you're pretty agnostic about. Uh, I think so. And then in terms of the, your scale thing, I mean, I, I just think replication in the commercial sector, an accepted route to growth is selling chunks of your company. We obviously can't do that, don't want to do that. <laughs> right. So how else can you do it in the commercial sector, franchising? Uh, or getting other people to run with your idea because they're bringing in capital, but also because of their sort of energy that they're bringing in, sweat equity, is a, is a really accepted route, route to growth. So there's the, the industry in the UK is 13.5 billion pounds. In the US, it's, I think, in excess of 80 billion. Yep. Um, so if, if they can do it, the stuff applies to the social sector, we should be yeah, doing it doing, as a route yeah. to scale, yeah. How about you, Nicolas? How important has the public sector been to uh, particularly the tremendous growth that you've experienced over the last few years? For, for us, the, 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 the public sector is absolutely fundamental. But it's more cultural. It's a cultural thing. Obviously, in France, uh, for you uh, in the US, I hear a lot, lots of your politicians say that uh, we're, we are socialist uh, <laughs> and in France and that we, the models we developed, we're like more linked to communism rather than capitalism. So, so culturally, obviously, the, the relationship with the state is really important to us because we believe in France, or m most of the French people believe that the state has an important role to play. And here there is a difference between our, our, our culture is that, uh, yes, we think that the state has to organize everything and has to say how um, for the social issues uh, what to do and for helping uh, for helping the poor. So we work closely with the state. It doesn't mean that uh, we get grant uh, subsidies and so on. We don't have this kind of things. We really on a market-based 
uh, and we find market-based solutions, but obviously uh, you need to, to understand uh, how it works in a country and so on. And it's, it's why when we're in France, in Italy or in Spain, we work with the state a lot because they are the only one and the only actors that know the keys and the real social issues where they are and the problems and all the needs that, 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 that you, you have. But when you, we go, for example, in, in Asia, especially in South Korea and Japan and so on, the, the state has not the same role, and so we work more with a big corporation, and, and these are the ones that care about the social good yeah. as well. So I think what I'm hearing from you is that um, you choose your partners depending upon uh, the developed country that you're expanding into. Sometimes the state's very important. Uh, culturally as well as for support, but often now you're finding it sounds like that uh, the private sector is going to turn out to be very important. Um, and certainly, um, I was about to ask you about, for example, I know you've expanded recently and are working with South Korea. Um, can you tell us just a little bit about what the relationships are there between private sector, public sector, and sort of enterprise? Uh, South Korea is absolutely fascinating. I, I, fascinating. I love this country uh, because uh, uh, 30 years ago it was it was a develop, developing countries. There was the, they, they had no food. It was really terrible. And in 30 years, they really achieved to become one of the top 10 uh, countries in the world. And but now the problem is uh, that they had big growth because of their very conservative system. So now they they have been able to develop uh, the economy and so on. But they just discovered three or four years ago that there were lots of poor people as well that they created lots of growth, but lots of people were also uh, were not on the good path and were facing difficulties. So they say they would like to do things, and especially the, the state wanted to do things. But what is quite interesting is that the state said, it's not my role to play, because culturally the state has not this part to play. Uh, but the big corporations should do that. So they, they asked the big corporation to find a, a market-based solution to fight uh, this kind of problems. And the big, the Samsung, the Hyundai, the LG, and this, all, yeah. the, all these big uh, Korean companies decided to develop inside their activity, inside their, their, this big organization, social businesses. So you see Samsung has three or four social businesses, uh, Hyundai has three or four of them, and so on. I had the privilege to be with Nicolas in uh, Europe a few weeks ago talking uh, on stage with a, a large European conference about this subject and our colleague from South Korea was there and it was really fascinating actually. Uh, if you think about, um, again, the comments uh, this morning about, uh, you know, when you're reaching scale, that's when, when big business wants to participate. Um, and I think that's an apt comment in some parts of the world, but in other parts of the world, an example is South Korea you're finding that the private sector is actually very interested um, in the social, uh, the social enterprise space. So part of what I really wanted to draw out in this conversation uh, over this hour is that I think um, we're getting a long ways down the path of creating a real conversation here at SOCAP. But one of the things I continue to observe is it's only in rooms like this that we get to take it apart a little bit and say, well, that's true in this part of the world, but it's not really true in this part of the world. And given how many of you raised your hands and said that you were social entrepreneurs, I think that's a really important um, discussion to continue. Um, how are you thinking about big business as part of your model? Um, Having spent your time at McDonald's. Yeah, well, no, so most recently, and probably relevant to this, we've just done uh, a three-month project for GlaxoSmithKline, the pharmaceutical company. Um, and it's been absolutely fascinating, because I come from the social sector, you know, I've run charities, and then suddenly I find myself in these big multinationals. Yeah. Um, and the surprising thing is that there are they're good people there. Like, these people have got <laughs> good hearts. I'm like, really? <laughs> um, which has been wonderful. So uh, I, I've been working with the senior vice president for the developing world. So that's the 50, uh, he runs the 50 poorest countries in the world. And um, they are, are pretty forward thinking. What, what they've done is rather than measuring their su the, the success and giving bonuses based on profits of the salespeople, they're giving them based on market access. Oh, so how many people are they actually reaching? Now, obviously, that absolutely transforms the way they think about who they should partner with, because it makes you know, NGOs, it makes all of these local players really interesting, good partners. 
And it also means that they don't have to worry as much about profits. I mean, obviously they are thinking about profits, but they're thinking medium to long term within these countries. So the piece of work we did for them was we looked at 1,400 health innovations from around the world. Um, and we then narrowed them down on a five point scale for replicability and, and, the, and the possibility of scale. And uh, we then actually sent three researchers out to Kenya and India over a couple of months and visited 50 projects and have narrowed that down and, and recommended to, to GSK which ones they might support. And those projects are a whole mix of different NGOs and, and others. So I think, uh, you know, going back to the point before, um, big business has real, real potential to make change. If they're the right partner, great. Sometimes they aren't. But actually, I think there are, there are people who are within big business who are really interested. And it's, it's kind of just getting to the right person. The person yeah. at the top makes a big difference. Are any, do any of you out in the audience represent the corporate side of life? Where are you from? Japan? We have terrible bright lights, so I'm sorry if I look like I'm squinting at you. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be great. Here comes Bjorn. He's gonna, I'm going to ask you again. Where are you from? Um, so I'm from Tokyo, and I work for a Japanese think tank. And we, do, we provide consultancy service to Japanese multinational corporations to do um, business with social enterprises in emerging markets at the bottom of the pyramid Perfect. market. Thank you very much. So we may come back to you um, for, for more conversation in a minute. Um, the, uh, and here in the, in the U.S., certainly in terms of my role here with uh, SOCAP, with our expansion of the hub concept around uh, the, uh, North America, with some of the things we're doing to accelerate entrepreneurship, I find that corporations are um, highly motivated to talk to us uh, at the intersection of innovation. So we, you know, when, when there's a, an opportunity to talk about a solution, um, I find uh, the corporate environment is very, very interested. Yeah. Uh, there's a microphone. Bjorn is going to help us out, so we turn this into more of a discussion. Oops. Thank you. I don't want to change the subject on you, but I do You can try question. it, and we'll, we'll, we'll see if we'll let you. Go ahead. I'm, I'm really <laughs> interested in the commercial relationship between the original social enterprise and then the franchisees. Basically, I'm interested in is 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 are these franchisees to use the um, to come back to the case studies that you gave us the Trustle Trust, Childline, and Group SOS. I'm interested in does the original um, social enterprise have a financial stake in the franchisees? Um, are you licensing the brand uh, or the business model? or are you doing it out of the good of your heart because you just want to see your model replicated? It's a fantastic question, and you're actually doing a great job of the segue that I think we should get to, which is, um, to me, it's sort of about how you're capitalizing your, you know, how you're capitalizing your strategies, and also, at what point does um, one form of capital strategy change to another, which I think is part of your question. Um, and if we don't get your question answered, we'll, we'll take it on again. So, Dan, I think, again, I'll start with you. Sure, yeah. Um, so, I'm terribly sorry. There's just no set rules, once again. And I think that, uh, you know, the paper I wrote was comparing McDonald's to the Trustful Trust. And I did that on purpose to sort of get, you know, very tight control commercial model through to more dissemination. So, you've got a, you've got a spectrum. And um, the, the decision you make as to how tightly you want to control just totally depends on your, your aims and, and what you want to do as an organization. So Food Bank, for example, is operating a, um, a model whereby they charge about $3,000 to basically buy the box with all the information in. And with that comes a whole lot of training um, and that sort of thing. Um, it's subsidized, so it, it would probably cost them double that much for each replication but they've set their price point so that you know, the idea can, can scale up big. So it's a sort of mixed model, and they think when they reach 350 that the center will be sustaining. Uh, they then charge about um, $1,000 a year for each replication. Um, you've got Le Mat, uh, which is a chain of hotels across uh, Europe. Um, they hire 50% of people with long-term disability. That is a very traditional commercial model each social franchise is um, generating income, 
but the, the franchisor at the center is doing all the marketing, uh, generating marketing material and, and, and um, that sort of stuff. And therefore, each um, franchise pays a percentage, you know, usually around 10%, something like that, to the center for those services. So operating in more of a McDonald's type way. And then honestly, you've got everything in the middle. I suppose just another quick one worth mentioning is just the pure dissemination model. Um, Aflatoon, uh, which does child um, uh, financial literary, literacy education, they created tw uh, six curricula uh, to teach children financial literacy. And I mean, I've seen lots of people create curricula. The challenge is not creating the curricula, it's how to get people to use the thing. So what they did is they've got a center in Amsterdam, uh, which is sort of the, the, the franchisor, uh, they don't call it that, but it's the center of expertise. Any NGO or organization running financial literacy training can apply for membership. Membership costs 50 euros a year, so it's nominal. Uh, since 2005, they've reached 82 countries. They've taught 2 million children already. And I mean, that number is just growing exponentially. So, they're using a model of replication uh, that, you know, it's not a full social franchise, they're making it very inexpensive, but they're reaching rapid, you know, dramatic levels of scale by just playing with the ownership model. Is that, is that, do you have a follow-on question to your question? I'm gonna have Nicholas um, try to respond if, if you're still good. Okay, so when you, um, Nicholas, when you, I know a little bit about your model and um, I think it's important for this audience to understand your revenue generation because, uh, you know, your, your capital is really um, self-generated at this point. Do you want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, yeah, sure. Um, just, just first, uh, if yeah, I just uh, can answer the question, it is, it's the right question. It's uh, definitely like this. What we do is uh, we have actually, and it's quite interesting because you do that a lot in the U.S. We're not used to speak about uh, the things that didn't work but uh, we always speak about the things that work, but uh, I think it's a, you can understand that. We had a really bad experience, actually, in trying to franchise and to rep replicate a model. Uh, we, we, it was really difficult to, to work with these people, even if they're really, they, they seem to be really committed at the beginning, but uh, at the end, we just discovered that it was not like this, and we had big problems. So at a certain point, we said, what, 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 we gonna, what we're gonna do? Are we just there to replicate with everyone, with everybody, work with everybody and just nothing? And at the end we say, no, it, it doesn't work like this. A project works when you want to work with someone and you, when there's a real fit. And I think that the most important thing is the hum, human relationship you create at the really beginning. That seemed to be maybe a little bit naive, but I'm sure from a business point of view, it really works like this, because if you're working with people that you don't want to work with, and you feel that it's not working, it won't work. I mean, it's very difficult to do that. So what we do, we don't have, because you have very few social enterprises that are, that, that achieve to scale, and then achieve to really to replicate their model, we still have this chance and this opportunity to choose the people we, we, we want to work them, uh, we, we, with whom we want to work, and then after to adapt the model in every country. As I said, uh, for example, if I big, work with big corporation in countries like South Korea, obviously I won't give it for free, uh, not because of me, but because it's fair and it's like this, but I can perfectly work and it's what I'm doing in other countries, in Italy or in Spain, with so young social entrepreneurs that would like to replicate the thing and I'm, I know that they're young social entrepreneurs, I know their situation, so I can do it, uh, I can do it for free. I mean, it's really open at this point of view. It depends with whom you're working and how far you want to go with in, the, in this relationship. What we try to do at Group SOS is, that, is always have to keep having a little stake, n not to be, not to have the majority because it's not, I think that it's not a, it's very difficult to do a big company and to own everything, but still to be implicated and to uh, give your insight and bring your experience and so on in the project. So still be uh, at 20 or 25 percent, or maybe less or more, but it's really open. But still have a look, but not controlling it, because it's impossible. I don't know in Japan or in South Korea, I'm not able to say what you need to do for solving the social problem. I mean, you need humility as well, and to be a little bit humble by, by doing this. 
So um, now tell me about how capital works and all that, because I think it has implications. Um, I, know that, I know that part of what can drive success for you is you have Le Comptoir, which can invest uh, as part of your organization. Can you tell, tell us a little bit about that? Sure. Yeah. Um, the business model is, is very simple, uh, is that we're working with, uh, we, we have lots of clients. We have private clients, public clients, individuals, uh, institutions and so on. It's really open, it depends on the activity. But what we try to do is to focus on the social issue. Uh, there, we have activities where, for example, with the, with, with the, public, with the public sector, we're working with them uh, for homeless people in France, in Paris. We host, uh, we find solutions for more than 2,000 homeless people in France every night and we, we, we care about them from a medical point of view. Why that? Because we went to the, to the public, the national insurance company, and we said, uh, what are you doing with the homeless people that are sick? Uh, because homeless people usually, uh, when they get, just have a flu, uh, they go to the hospital and they take drugs, and then they go back under the bridge. But under the bridge, if it's uh, minus 10 uh, degrees Celsius, even if you, you have medication, it won't get better. So after three days under the bridge, they get really, really sick, and they're brought into a public hospital. And it's the public hospital that pays for that. And it costs 300 euros per night per person. And so that's a big problem for the state, because it's the state that pays for that. So what we, we told to the, to the national insurance company, we said, you're paying for that. Uh, what we could do, if you give us a third of what you would give in this case, we can care about this guy and maybe be even more efficient because we will have social workers that will work with this guy and maybe try a long-term solution for him. So that's typically how we work with the public sector is that we prove, and it's the SROI, the Social Return on Investment, that we prove that working with us, they will save money and the quality of the social service will be better as well. So it's proving the efficiency in terms of cost and in, in, or cost and in terms of quality, that's with the, the, the public sector. For, with, the public, with the private sector, we can work with big corporation. We have a caterer, for example. We're doing catering with long-term excluded people from the labor market. So we're doing caterer, uh, catering when our clients are private companies. Why do they buy our food that we produce through the caterer? Not because the people are excluded, because if you have... Uh, if you're doing marketing just saying that it's made by excluded people, if when the food is not good, the food is not good. And they have clients, they have people. So we hired the best chef of uh, two years ago, we hired the best chef of France and, and asked him if he wants to get involved in this project. And so now we've become one of the top three caterers in France. But the people that are our clients, they don't know that the people that are working are long-term excluded. So we try to, 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 ch to change the things like this. And so that's working with the private sector. And with individuals, we have shops, we have lots of things. But for every single uh, org entity that we have, we always try to find the right business model. We have uh, uh, re rentability is important. We reinvest all well, what we earn, we reinvest everything in the activity because we're totally social oriented and we're focused on that. When we have the chance not having a, a very um, greedy uh, shareholders. Um, so we're happy by do, uh, in doing that, but the model is that we develop an economic model for every single activity, trying to solve all these social issues. It's not always possible, but we try to do that. So after, when we, you replicate that in other countries, uh, the relationship is totally different. Even if you have the solution, the, the, the clients will not be the same, the people will not be, the people will be different, the social needs can be also different, so you always have to adapt. And the best way to do that is to find local partners, and these, one, these guys, the local guys, are the ones that are able to tell us uh, what to do, and we, so we work always in partnership. We're not taking our French flag and bringing it and putting it everywhere we're going. I think this is a great chance to uh, actually 
turn this really truly into a conversation among us, and it looks like you've got your hand up. Here's what I think. I think what we have in the audience are people who are interested in executing on social solutions, and we have on stage, we have a couple of opportunities, as I mentioned. So I'd like to just sort of turn this over with Bjorn's help to some of you to just ask, ask your questions. But let's do it in the spirit of, you know, um, I don't want you to stand up and give a pitch <laughs> uh, for your enterprise. I want you to, uh, let's try to work together to figure out um, what these opportunities really consist of. Please, go ahead. You had your hand up first, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't really want to pitch my uh, social no, enterprise. Fine. I just have a question for, for Dan or... Yeah. Um, I, said, I said we wouldn't let you pitch anyway. So. No, okay. Yeah, that's what I meant. But I'm not going to explain about my business. It's not yeah. really interesting now. Um, I'm, I'm really interested in, in, in the franchising, uh, what you're doing. I just, at the previous session, I walked up to the, uh, to the people from the panelists, the panelists and asked them, do you have some more best practices what correlates with my project? So it's always a question that, uh, that remains. Um, however, I... From my point of view, at least, I would recommend to not use the franchising definition that much because it's kind of, um, yeah, people can um, interpret it in a wrong way, I guess, too simplistic, like you already mentioned, it's about diversity, um, the context, uh, implementation that you, you are based in, uh, impl implementation, so you have to be aware of that always. Um, so you should, I think, think about that a little bit that if you want to work with certain countries or something that they don't feel like oh you're 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 part of McDonald's like you already uh, do not want to would you want to distinguish distinguish yourself from um, and furthermore I was wondering uh, the business approach you com you had a comparison in the beginning and I was wondering businesses have an approach from a marketing perspective. Uh, if you work to the supermarkets, uh, they know exactly where to put the chocolate, so they can brainwash the consumer more or less about buying it. And I was wondering, um, how will you do this with uh, for social uh, entrepreneurs? Um, let's let's stop you right there. Yeah. Um, is that is that the first part of your question? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Dan. Um, okay. So. Well, on the first question, I absolutely, I mean, I, I'm going around and talking about franchising all over the place, so I'm very aware of people's mixed understanding of the, of the word. I had to choose a word, uh, and I thought quite long and hard about what it might be. Replication, repeatability, franchising, they're all sort of these Latin words, and you put social and franchising together, and people, there's no ideal way to express this stuff. So I picked one. And basically, as long as people come and open dialogue about how they can replicate and scale up, that's fine with me. Um, in terms of your question, uh, so uh, if, if, if I can take it as about sharing of best practice um, and, and what really works. Um, so I'll, I'll use an example, first of all, from McDonald's in the early days. The, the Big Mac was actually invented by a franchisee. Um, and, uh, you know, that might seem like a little sort of crass point, but actually when you have a network, for example, within the food bank of 250 organizations running the same uh, systems and processes being monitored on the same uh, evaluation platforms, one uh, innovation in one area, for example, one food bank has just discovered that they can generate income um, because they're community-based, by getting second-hand clothing donated and then selling it on. One food bank discovered they could do that, and then very quickly that was disseminated across the entire network of 250 food banks. So I think um, the, the, what the network does with the scale is it just allows you to innovate across the network and really share best practice quite uh, efficiently, effectively. Over here, I think. Thanks. And then I think the woman behind in the second row had a question, too. Um, thank you very much for the presentations. I was wondering, um, in your experiences, have you had problems with branding? At the end of the day, you're working with organizations that are, are natural allies. How does, how does the branding work in there if you're trying to replicate a model across countries and across sectors? Want to take that first? Yes. <laughs> uh, I have an interesting story. We're we're developing in South Korea uh, one of our uh, structure, and that is called T in French. Uh, T is really smart, really nice. It's a really nice French word, but it means uh, actually uh, something dirty in Korean. So when you want to replicate and you have the brand, 
obviously if the name the you know means something different in another country is very difficult so what we we really we still for that also we really open and we say that obviously you have to protect your brand because i we had also difficulties in some countries where uh, you you had um, other people that try to 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 take the brand and do something with that so you still have you still in the business world and you still have sharks and people that want to uh, you know to to take what what you what you built and what you create but uh, still it's really open i mean it's uh, once again it's not about replicating we don't want for example replicate absolutely the group sos and put a flag on it and say that's our brand and see the network and so on and have a big map on our website and so on and say and show how strong we are. It's more about replicating a solution that is adapted to a local context. So the brand is something obviously important in terms of Im image and communication, but sometimes it's better uh, to really to set up a, a, a new brand that is adapted to the local context and so on. So you really have to be open and uh, on that and uh, not to be focused on your expansion and so on and more into I, what I want to replicate and what I want to do is to help the other people uh, and to get faster in solving the social issues uh, they're facing. I know, oh there, over here. And I know that this lady had a question we didn't get to. So after you, we'll go back to her. <laughs> Um, my name is Max Pischelik. Um I run a commercial accelerator in sub-Saharan Africa, out of South Africa. Um, looking at many um, different um, uh, franchise models and replication models, um, I wanted to ask a question on collaborative governance. Because the ones that I've seen are most successful, it doesn't, it doesn't have this very strict hierarchy, yet it has some sort of level of quality control. And there's definitely a network and collaborative governance effect that helps scalability and replicability um, and engendering leaders within, within the network. And I just want to see if there are any comments or insights into that. It's a fantastic question. Um, and certainly speaks to this idea of openness and focus on people and solutions. Do I, would you like to take it first? Yeah, sure. I've, there's one just brilliant example of, of this, I think. And, and this speaks to, you know, is it franchising, is it not? Well, if somebody's replicating to, to, to scale and they're using the replication as a tool to, to um, spread their model, I think that, that's a great thing. Um, they're called Comossi, based in uh, Flanders in Belgium. Essentially, uh, five or six different uh, people who own charity shops, second-hand shops, you call them thrift shops here, I think. Uh, were um, employing uh, mainly people with long-term disability. And um, they were coming under increased pressure from the commercial sector. So they said, hey, you know, we're all doing this on our own. Let's get together and create a, a network. So that was um, sort of about 10 years ago, and the network grew. There's now 100 of these charity shops in the network. What happened over time, they decided they wanted to be under the same brand because if you're selling stuff, and this comes back to the brand question, you know, whether or not you are under the brand or you're uh, you know, powered by the brand, with, you know, the, the, their, they can keep their brand name, just depends on the product you're selling. But in the case of a charity shop, they needed to be under the same brand because they wanted the quality to be the same across everywhere. So there's now 100 uh, of these charity shops in the network. And what was interesting is that over time, they formed a federation. And actually, the center, they started to, to, to put more and more of the tasks centrally. So things like um, the marketing, the branding, um, and then you know, strategic thinking about uh, you know, how they could best get their products out there, uh, things like talking to government, uh, all of that stuff became central. So actually, they've sort of ended up with a, f with a franchise model, but each of the 100 uh, shop shops comes together twice a year and actually sets the policy of the center. So you've got this great sort of uh, symbiotic rela relationship. And I think that there are a number of ways to make that relationship happen. It sort of fits into the whole cooperative movement. But when you get it right and the incentives are right, it really is, I think, very powerful. Uh, I'm Diana Pollard from Dallas, Texas. Uh, I'm a business consultant, and I have worked with several for-profit companies that use franchise models. Uh, one of the issues they have, and I would like to hear how you deal with it, is 
um, not just strategic thinking, but strategic planning, looking five years, 20 years into the future. Uh, I know that can be very, very difficult for uh, a franchised company, and I was just wondering for companies that are social enterprises, you know, wh what are you seeing? <laughs> have, you, have you got experience with thinking about the sort of long horizon with some of your partners uh, in the developed world? Um, can you talk a little bit about uh, how you try to engender that kind of strategic thinking as opposed to just, now we've got them as partners, let's, let's, let's hope it all goes well. <laughs> Yes, for example, we're doing also franchising. It's one of the parts for the, we have a fair trade network that is called Alter Mundi, that are fair, fair trade shops, and it's the first network in, uh, in France and one of the biggest, I think, in Europe as well. We, so we're doing franchising, and it's really, really complicated to do franchising. Uh, that's for, from our point of view, when you do it in a, in a really classical business way, I mean, when it's a social enterprise, because the people are committed, obviously, from a personal point of view, to do a social, uh, a social business, and then the other way, you have these contracts or these franchising contracts that can be really terrible sometimes and really <laughs> difficult. And so, it's something that we're really working on: is to to become smoother in the way uh, we set up this kind of relationship, and not to be and not try to. Uh, it's always the same, but I'm not trying to replicate exactly, uh, you know, uh, the things. Obviously, quality is important when you use a brand. Quality is fundamental, so we can check that. But you can do that in taking... I'm more into joint ventures. I really believe in this uh, joint venture things. When you really take a stake and you really, you, you're really you implicated in the project and you work hand in hand with the people, uh, franchising social businesses is, to me, I mean, quite difficult, and I prefer doing joint venture, but I'm sure that, there, that you have uh, other examples that shows the, the country. Have you thought through how, you, how to try to engender that sort of strategic long view? Uh, can you give us a couple of, yeah, Yeah, I mean, I, I, mean I absolutely, the, the things you're saying about this being difficult, it's, it's very true, you know, but, but behind each of the stories here and the other ones I've talked about, um, the reason why they've succeeded is because people are thinking strategically for the long term. I mean, in the commercial sector, in the UK certainly, it's five to eight years before a commercial franchise is ready to grow exponentially. So if we're talking strategically over five to eight years, you have to, at the point where you choose you're going to replicate, uh, do it properly, you have to go through all the systemizations, you have to make sure you're getting the right franchi franchisees, you have to test and test and test again before you're ready to grow exponentially. So it, this is not an easy thing to do, and sadly, the, the, the devil is in the detail. So you miss one or two little details, and it really can have major knock-on effects. So I think that there's, um, you know, uh, I don't know the, the people that you're working with, but I think certainly in the social enterprise space, if you're not thinking strategic long-term at least 10 years, then, uh, you know, this is probably not for you. <laughs> Do you think that part of the difference in the social enterprise world is that sort of deep personal kind of stake in it that perhaps transcends some of the, the kind of grittiness of the commercial franchise model? I don't know. It's a tough one. I mean, when I asked Matt Donalds what the most important thing to remember in yeah. franchising is, they said the people. And it's I don't think team. that's necessarily <laughs> different to non-franchises, but I do think that if the people are wrong in a franchise system, and it's exactly what you were talking about, this is a marriage, and if you get the wrong franchisee, they feel like they're owning their organization, and the thing breaks down in spectacular style. So you've really got to make sure that the person is right. Now, in the commercial world, you know, the people running McDonald's, uh, they passionately believe in what they're doing. They would not get a franchisee right. unless they believed in the, project, the product 100% and really wanted to sell that stuff. So, um, while, yes, the motivation is different in a food bank, it's usually churches and these are people who, you know, believe from, from their faith they should be doing this. You know, if you're not interested, if you're not, if you're not in right. it for the right reasons, it doesn't work across the spectrum, right. I'd say. I'm, by the way, a California native and old enough to <laughs> be able to tell you about this sort of original McDonald's. I mean, in the sense that, you know, in the, I don't know if anyone else in the room can share this with me, but... In the early days of McDonald's, at least in California, um, the spirit of McDonald's was just as you just described. I mean, they would not come out with anything that wasn't part of the vision of this guy, you yeah. know, who had founded this 
amazing golden arch hamburger thing. You know, to, I haven't eaten a McDonald's hamburger in 35 years, but, <laughs> but you know, I, I certainly remember from my childhood this sort of story that you know, um, in the 60s, my parents would bring home and tell us about this guy that you know was really an entrepreneur. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the theme is obviously people here. Um, did you want to say something? Yes. Yeah, then just, we'll turn you into the question. I, I yeah. add something really quickly. I think, yes, it's about the people. And when you think about the strategy, uh, as I mentioned, how we, we create our group, it's first, we didn't have this vision, this global vision of saying we're going to be this big social company. At the, we had a social problem. We wanted to solve it. It's a quite a short-term kind of thing. And then we created and we developed everything. And then we're doing this kind of activities, but we're quite surprised uh, ourselves to have all these kind of things and you you it's really difficult when we when you ask the founder for example of my organization why did you do that he said yeah but I didn't have this vision I mean my vision is to be always very flexible and to adapt all the time because social needs they change very quickly as well and you always have to adapt and I think it's not necessary to have a long-term vision it's like a business plan I mean you know that on a business plan, what is written in five and ten years, you never have to believe it because <laughs> you never will, you can't right. know what will happen. And I think you need to be humble on that as well. There's something that keeps going through my head, and I don't know if we'll get to it on stage, but it's a question I'd really like to converse about off stage, if possible, which is, as someone who's an entrepreneur myself, one of the things that we're talking about is this importance of the fit of the person. Mm -hmm. And when that goes one of the ways in which that goes badly for entrepreneurs is when you're trying to access capital. Um, you know, if you are trying to raise capital as opposed to having um, a capital, you know, having already solved your capital problems, often that's when you get into trouble, my observation, as an entrepreneur in terms of um, uh, finding yourself, uh, this is another American slang, in bed <laughs> with the wrong, you know, with the wrong people. And once you start down that path, it can be extremely difficult, particularly if you're a social enterprise, to untangle those knots. And so um, that's something that keeps going through my head as I listen to this extraordinary focus on the relationship, the people, the way to adapt to the local model, but yet use these methods that are really tried and true from the commercial side about uh, replication to scale. There's a question back there. Um, and then one here, and then one here. And we have three minutes, so we probably have time for one, two, three. Oh, we'll go this way, okay. <laughs> There's one back here to uh, Bjorn, and then one here. Uh, hi, thank you guys. Um, I'm from Vision Spring, and we do a little bit of franchising. Um, and something we're doing now is scaling through partnerships. And something that we're constantly, um, I guess, struggling with or, or challenged by is this vetting process. And you mentioned passion and the people as being one of them. But uh, that does take you to a certain point. But have you had experience with uh, these local partners in country that have not been good fits for partners? Have you seen, um, you know, like a, a, a strict vetting process as something that's um, important, or is it more of a flexible case-by-case -case basis on how you you judge potential partners to help you scale this um, your models? And I know Nicolas has already articulated this this very, very focused effort to find the right people. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to ask you, Dan, have you added anything to your vetting process that would be unusual or unique that might be responsive to this question? Is there something that you've thought about that we haven't already talked about that's sort of a twist on the vetting process? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it depends on the different organization. What, what commercial franchising research has shown is that um, when people are franchising for the first time, they tend to select usually one in one in ten they'll take on as a franchisee. Um, this is just in the UK, so I don't know how it translates. Now, what, what happens, or even less than that, you know, one in three, one in four, what tends to happen is that the first few franchisees then, the relationship is really hard. You know, you've probably chosen slightly the wrong person, and because you're learning as well, um, they're probably slightly more entrepreneurial than your ideal franchisee profile. And actually, once you get past that initial bump of the first three, five franchisees, and you, and you know exactly what the profile of the person is you're looking for, uh, you know, the next 100 are a lot easier. <laughs> so I think probably just a more general comment there rather than specific. Yes. 
Uh, Kate Store Architecture for Humanity. I would agree with that. You know your profile. I can smell an Architecture for Humanity person a mile away. Right. But um, <laughs> I, uh, I wanted to bad. ask. Yeah. I wanted, and they smell great. Um, I, I wanted to point out that um, you know NGOs have been doing this for God eons, right? Yeah. We all have chapters and affiliates. Yeah. And I was wondering if you had done any work, either of you, looking at that model and the revenue model behind that, the revenue sharing, the control and so on. Thank you. Yeah, we, we, we have a, a, a great experience in doing that because uh, I think that the, the, the NGO model has been a catastrophe globally uh, in the way they, they organize that and it's why it's important also, it's interesting bringing this part of business. I mean, we are half an NGO, half a bit classical business, we half the state, we half, so we're quite a mix of all of that. And obviously the model of the NGO has been the first one we looked at. And we said, how, how, how did they do that? And you have lots of NGOs that are not coordinated. For example, you, you have NGOs that, like the Red Cross. You have Red Cross France, Red Cross Germany, Red Cross, I mean, everywhere. And they're not coordinated at all. I mean, they're, it's, it's, it's something just about a brand and without coordination. And you see that in the, the word of the NGOs, you see that a lot. And it's not very useful, actually. It's just a name that you know and so on. And they haven't been able to neutralize their experiences, to neutralize their uh, knowledges and so on. And it's what I think when you're a social business, you have to learn for the big corporation is this ability to make things more efficient. Yeah, I, well said. <laughs> and without efficiency, of course, you can't achieve scale since the yeah. definition of scale, of course, is, is that as you grow bigger, your efficiency becomes greater. I think there's... Yeah, thank you. Hi, my name is Jasmine Rodriguez and I'm the CEO of Hot Bread Kitchen, which, which is a social enterprise in New York. And we've grown quickly and are now expanding and considering a franchise model. And one of the things, we're incorporated as a nonprofit organization, but have had real commercial success and are thinking about whether or not it makes sense for expansion to happen in a for-profit or a non-profit model. So I'm wondering if you've seen any examples that have been successful or any sort of cautionary tales around that question of either having a, a sub-organization that has a different kind of corporate structure than the, than the parent. And probably all three of us have had experience with hybrid organization structures, but um, this sounds kind of like it's Dan's. Um, yeah, I, so this comes back to the no set rules thing. So th th there's, there's quite a bit of work that we needed to really understand the model to know, uh, you know which one is best for you. Um, so once again, I think probably most useful is a more general comment rather than specific, which is, um, and maybe this is just to social enterprises generally, but the ones, the ones I'm seeing, the, the, the for-profit models that I'm seeing that are successful, whether they're you know, actually incorporators and NGOs or whatever, are ones who are really clear about what comes first. Is it, is it generating income or is it, is it the social value? Now, I'm not saying um, that then social value isn't important. You can have an organization that puts profit first and social. But um, the risk of being a for-profit model but having social more important is that actually if you're not earning money and the person running the organization isn't receiving a salary, the whole thing doesn't work. <laughs> So the critical for me is just setting values, you know, being really sure about where your value is, what you're, what you're willing and not willing to compromise on on the social side, and then but being absolutely fixed on saying, number one is this has to generate income, and we're going to find a way to do that. So it, it's a balancing act, and um, it is, it's a difficult space to negotiate and slightly different for each person's model. One question I might ask myself if I were in your shoes too is if, if it, if, if I were deciding today about my current enterprise and whether it was prof for profit or non profit based on our success so far, and I hadn't already chosen to be an NGO, what, what would I be today as a way to help think about that question? Um, that's certainly been helpful to me a little bit in the past. Um, I think we're just about out of time. It's going, the clock's going the other way, which I think tells us that we've run out of time. <laughs> um, but um, I suspect some of you would like to pursue individual conversations and I believe both of you are around the next couple of days. Well, I, 
and I'm uh, actually a couple of us are going to go meet up in Great. the hub. So there if, we go. If, You're if already we meeting up. <laughs> walk over. If people have specific questions, want to carry on the conversation. I don't know if you're around, but if there are people, happy to do that. And thank you very much for this uh, conversation with us, and have a great lunch, which I think is being served just after this.